When a pod is scheduled by Kubernetes, it's important that containers have enough resources to actually run. If you schedule a large app on a node with limited resources, it's possible the node runs out of memory or CPU and things just stop working. In this episode of Kubernetes Best Practices, let's take a look at how you can solve these problems using resource requests and limits. Requests and limits are the mechanisms Kubernetes uses to control resources such as CPU and memory. Requests are what the container is guaranteed to get. If a container requests a resource, Kubernetes will only schedule it on a node that can give it that resource. Limits, on the other hand, make sure a container never goes above a value. The container is only allowed to go up to the limit, and then it's restricted. Let's see how these work. So there's two types of resources, CPU and memory. The Kubernetes scheduler uses these to figure out where to run your pods. A typical spec for a pod for resources might look something like this. Each container in the pod can set its own requests and limits, and these are all additive. CPU resources are defined in millicores. If your container needs two full cores to run, you'd put the value 2000M. If your container only needs one fourth of a core, you would put a value of 250M. One thing to keep in mind is that if you put a value in that's larger than the core count of your biggest node, then your pod will never be scheduled. Let's say you have a pod that needs four cores, but your Kubernetes cluster is just comprised of two core VMs. In this case, your pod will never be scheduled. So unless your app is specifically designed to take advantage of multiple cores, you know, things like scientific computings and some databases come to mind, it's usually a best practice to keep the CPU request at one or below and then run more replicas to scale it out. This gives the system more flexibility and more reliability. When it comes to CPU limits, things get interesting. So CPU is considered a compressible resource. If your app starts hitting your CPU limits, Kubernetes will start to throttle your container. This means your CPU will be artificially restricted, giving your app potentially worse performance. However, it won't be terminated or evicted. Memory resources are defined in bytes. Normally, you give a mebibyte value for memory, but you can give it from anything from bytes to petabytes. Just like CPU, if you put a memory request that's larger than the amount of memory on your nodes, the pod will never be scheduled. Now, unlike CPU resources, memory is not compressible. Because there's no way to throttle memory usage, if a container goes past its memory limit, it'll be terminated. It's important to remember that you cannot set requests that are larger than the resources provided by your nodes. You can find the total resources for GKE VMs at this link. In an ideal world, the container settings would be good enough to take care of everything, but the world is a dark and terrible place. People can easily forget to set the resources, or a rogue team can set their requests and limits very high and take up more than their fair share of the cluster. To prevent these scenarios, you can set up resource quotas and limit ranges. After creating a namespace, you can lock them down using quotas. For example, if you have a production and development namespace, a common pattern is to put no quota on production and then put very strict quotas on the development namespace. This allows production to take all the resources that it needs in case of a spike in traffic, and development is locked down. A quota for resources might look something like this. In this example, you can see that there are four sections. Let's go into each one. Request.cpu is the maximum combined CPU request that all containers in the namespace can have. So in this example, you can have 50 containers with 10M requests, five containers with 100M requests, or just one container with 500 M's of requests. As long as the total requested CPU in the namespace is less than 500 M, we're good to go. Request.memory is the maximum combined memory request that all containers in the namespace can have. So again, in the above example, you can have 50 containers with two MIB requests, five containers with 20 MIB requests, or just one container with 100. As long as the total requested memory in the namespace is less than 100 MB. Limits.cpu is the maximum combined CPU limits that all the containers in namespace can have. You know, it's just like request.cpu, but for the limits. And then finally, limits.memory is the maximum combined memory limits that all containers in the namespace can have. Again, just like the request.memory, but for the limit instead. You can also create a limit range in your namespace. 
Unlike a quota, which looks at the whole namespace, a limit range enforces itself on individual containers. So this can help prevent people from creating super tiny or super large containers inside the namespace. A limit range might look something like this. So looking at the example, you can see again, there's four sections. Let's go into each one. The default section will set up the default limits for a container in the pod. If you set these values in the limit range, any containers that don't explicitly set these values themselves will get assigned the default values. The default request section will set up the default requests for a container in a pod. Again, if you set these values in the limit range, any containers that don't explicitly set these themselves will get assigned these default values. The max section will set up the maximum limits that a container in a pod can set. The default section cannot be set higher than this value, and the limits on a container cannot be higher as well. It's important to note that if this value is set and the default section is not set, the max value becomes the default value as well. The min section will set up the minimum requests that a container in a pod can set. The default request section cannot be lower than this, and requests set on a container cannot be lower as well. Again, it's important to note that if this value is set and the default request section is not set, the minimum value becomes the default request as well. So, you know, at the end of the day, these resources requests are used by the Kubernetes scheduler to run your workloads. And it's kind of important to understand how this works so you can tune your containers correctly. So let's say you want to run some pods on your cluster. Assuming the pod specifications are valid, the Kubernetes schedule will use round robin load balancing to pick a node to run your workload. So Kubernetes will check if the node has enough resources to fulfill the request on the pod's containers. If it doesn't, then it'll move on to the next node. If none of the nodes in the system have resources left to fill the requests, then pods go into a pending state. By using Google Kubernetes Engine's features such as the node autoscaler, GKE can automatically detect the state and then create more nodes automatically. And then if there's an excess capacity of nodes, the autoscaler can scale it down and remove nodes to save you money. So Kubernetes schedule these pods based on the requests. But a limit can be higher than the requests, right? So this means that there, in some scenarios, a node can actually run out of resources. And we call this an overcommitted state. So when it comes to CPU, like we said before, Kubernetes will start to throttle the pods. Each pod will get as much as it requested, but you know, it might not be able to go up to the limit. It'll start throttling it down. But when it comes to memory, Kubernetes has to make some decisions on which pods to kill and which pods to keep to free up system resources. Otherwise, the whole system will crash. So let's imagine a scenario where you have a machine that's kind of running out of memory. What will Kubernetes do? So Kubernetes will look for pods that are using more resources than they're requested. So if your containers have no requests at all, then by default, they're using more than they're requested because they requested nothing, right? So these are prime candidates for termination. Another prime candidate are containers that have gone over their requests, but are still under the limit. So if Kubernetes finds multiple pods that have gone over the request, then Kubernetes will rank these pods by priority and then terminate the lowest priority pods first. If all the pods have the same priority, then Kubernetes terminates the pod that have gone the most over its request. In very rare scenarios, Kubernetes might be forced to terminate pods that are still within their requests. This can happen when critical system components like the kubelet or Docker start taking more resources than were reserved for them. So while your Kubernetes cluster might work fine without setting resource requests and limits, you're gonna start running into more and more issues as your teams and projects start to grow larger. Adding re requests and limits to your pods and namespaces only takes a little extra effort and can save you from running into many headaches down the line. I'll see you on the next episode of Kubernetes Best Practices.